truly thankful for the presence of each and every one in our audience. We're thankful for your being here, for the encouragement that we can be to one another, and we pray that our coming together is for the sole purpose of worshiping God, doing so in spirit and truth, so that our worship will be pleasing to Him, and that in all that we say and do, that only glory and honor will be given unto Him. So good to see those that struggle with their health, uh, able to be with us this morning. Good to see Sister Regina, Sister Davis, and also Jeff with us. Others, of course, that have health problems or health is not what they would like for it to be, but nevertheless, your being here is also an encouragement to us. And we're thankful for the visitors. We're thankful for those that may have logged on to the website or the other means of the internet that makes it possible for you to be able to both see and hear the services here. One thing I would like to add to what Stephen made remark concerning uh, the young living bread, we know that, of course, Sister Edna did that for many decades. And it was not until the last two weeks of her life that she was not able to and did not. So certainly we tried through the years to show and to tell her the appreciation that we had for her loyalty, her dedication, and her desire to always be responsible for the unleavened bread. As Stephen mentioned, there is a list on the board, and I do appreciate all of the ladies that have signed up to be of assistance in that area. But I say this because thanks to the help of Hillary, uh, she gave, she has, and she gave me uh, two recipes for the sake of the other ladies that are on that list in case uh, you do not have a recipe. She has one that Sister Edna had given her and also one that Sister Mildred Ward had given her. So she'll either give them to you or I have them in my possession as well, and so if you would like to have a copy of that, certainly uh, ask me and I'll be glad to get a copy of either or both of uh, those recipes that both of those godly women uh, gave and we are able to have a record of. In John chapter 5, verse 23, it says that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent me. There are two things that are clearly evident from John chapter 5, verse 23. One of those is that all men should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. We just finished the song, Jesus is all the world to me. And certainly, let this lesson reinforce that song that we just sung. The fact that we, as humans, we should honor the Son just as we honor the Father. And the other thing in John chapter 5 is that the one who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So we learn from other passages that the only way to the Father is through the Son. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father except by me. And also the one that is pleasing to the Son is also pleasing to the Father and vice versa. In 2 John, verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. So let us notice some distinct ways in honoring Christ that we can also honor both Him and the Father. We honor Christ, certainly, by imitating. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, 
It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In 1 Peter 2, verse 21, for even unto, unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. So we must be then conformed to his image. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, has put, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. In 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, he says, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's in Romans 8 and verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among the brethren. And two, we need to do the Father's will, just as Jesus did. That is imitating the Lord and thereby honoring the Lord. In John 4, verse 34, Jesus said unto them, the King James says, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. The New King James says, My food is to do the will of him. In John chapter 6 and verse 38, Jesus said, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And we need to serve as Jesus served. That is imitating Jesus and therefore honoring Jesus. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And it's also in Luke chapter 22 and verse 27. For where do is greater? He that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth? Is not he that sitteth at meat? But then Jesus says, But I am among you as he that serveth. We also, to imitate Jesus, need to be obedient as he was. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, though he were a son, yet learned his obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. We need to be humble as he was. That too is to be imitated. In John chapter 13, Verse 4, and then reading verses 13 through 17. He said, He rises from supper and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. And then in verse 13, he says, You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. So yes, we need to be humble, obedient as he was. We need to pray as he did. That is another thing that we need to imitate. And in so doing, we will bring honor to Christ. Remember Mark chapter 1, verse 35, just one of the many times that we have Jesus praying. It said it in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place. And there he prayed. We need to forgive as the Lord forgave. 
In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his garments and cast lots. And we know what that occasion was all about. We need to freely give as he gave. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might be rich. You know, we follow Jesus because he is the standard for goodness. No one can exceed his character. No one can exceed his life. It was impossible for even the evil Jews to convict Jesus of sin. And if there was any person or a group of persons that could have produced evil, don't you think they would have? Because they tried to catch him in every word that he said, they tried to catch him in nearly every act that he committed. So truly, if there was ever any sin in Jesus' life, those that lived in his day and time and were the enemies at that particular point would have had and produced the evidence. But instead, what we see in John 8 and verse 46 is, Jesus said, which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Jesus was not guilty of sin to be convinced of sin. Neither that the fact is, and in all things that he said, was there things that he could be trapped because all of what Jesus said was true. Jesus Christ appeals to each and every one of us who realize our imperfections. To any of us and all of us that have a desire to do better, to excel. Jesus lived on a higher plane and truly let us seek to walk that higher ground. You know, we follow Jesus too because his teaching is far superior to that of any human being, dead or alive, even to this day, Jesus' teaching is superior. The Sermon on the Mount that we read about in beginning in Act, uh, not Acts, but the beginning in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount is the greatest of the most incredible teaching. In fact, there were some of those in Jesus' day that thought so. In Matthew chapter 7, notice that Jesus is bringing an end to this sermon, what's stated in verses 28 and 29. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribe. It's my understanding that the scribes, they were fond of quoting one another. It's my understanding that the scribes often referred to famous rabbis who had since died to make quotations from them. Jesus did none of that. It was far different, and no wonder they were astonished, and no wonder they realized that, yes, he is speaking with authority. You see, the Lord's teaching carried absolute authority because he was the son of God. And when we abide in his teaching, then we can truly be his disciple. In John chapter 8, verse 31, you remember a very familiar statement. Then Jesus said to those Jews that believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's 
on the wall near the main entrance to the Alamo. I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. The battle between Texas and Mexico concerning the ownership of what we now know as the state of Texas. There was a great battle fought at the Alamo. But at the entrance to the Alamo, and this is in San Antonio, Texas, there is a portrait. And underneath this portrait is this statement, and I quote, James Butler Bonham, no picture of him exists. This portrait is of his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. It's placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. End of quote. You know, I've met Byron's nephew. I don't think you could put a picture of his nephew and say, well, that's Byron, because there's not hardly any resemblance. But here is one that was a nephew, and he was so close in resemblance to his uncle. His uncle was a brigadier that was fought in the battle. They didn't have a picture of him, so they put his nephew. If you could look at his nephew, you could effectively see this James Bonham that fought in the Battle of the Alamo. You know, likewise, there's no literal portrait that we have of Jesus Christ. Oh, I know there's pictures everywhere, but that is just some man, Michelangelo or whoever, concept of what they think and thought that Jesus looked like. There is no actual literal portrait of Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, his image can be seen in his word, and his image needs to be seen in the lives of you and me if we profess to be Christians. We honor Christ by confessing him before men. Let's look at Jesus' own confession. Matthew 26, verse 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter, shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. This is the very statement that put Jesus to death. Jesus was put to death because of his confession. Because all you got to do is look at the very next verse. The verses that we read in verses 63 and 64, look at verse 65 and 66. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now we have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. We are to verbally confess Jesus. We're to confess the Lord Jesus. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You know, it's in Genesis 1 and verse 27 where the Bible says that God made man, male and female, created he him. So we can see that man, the word man can refer to both male and female because it's still within the human race, the human species. Well, that same word we find in 1 John 1, verses 1 and 2, that same principle. 
In 1 John 1, verses 1 and 2 is a very familiar verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So the Word that we're seeing here is God. And what we're seeing is, just like the word man can refer to both male and female, the word God can refer to both the Father and the Son. And that's what John is saying here. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So Jesus, the Son, and God, the Father, are both God. We dishonor God. We, I'm sorry, we dishonor Christ when we fail to confess him before men. And that's going to result in tragedy. In Matthew chapter 10, another very familiar verse, verse 32. Whoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Now, look at the next verse, verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So yes, there are some very serious consequences when we fail to confess Christ before men. In fact, there's a day coming in which every human being, every man will confess Christ. We know that in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 11, when it says that at every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God the Father. So see, those that refuse or those that neglect to confess Christ now, they will be forced to confess in that great day. We honor him by continuing to confess him on a daily basis. And what I hope we understand by this is the fact that confessing is not just a one-time act. Baptism may be a one-time act, and it is, but not confessing. Confessing is the other parts of the plan of salvation that leads up to baptism. Baptism is the only act that of which there is only but one time to do, but as far as hearing, believing, repenting, and confessing, those are not one-time acts. Confessing is not a one-time act. It continues a whole lifetime as it is to be in confessing Christ by the way that we live. We continue to do so when we sing, when we pray, when we worship God in any of the acts of worship. You know, it's in Hebrews chapter 13. And verse 15, it says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. That giving thanks in that verse literally means, in fact, if you have a New King James Version or if you have a New American Standard Version, in the margin of those Bibles, that given thanks is a footnote. And the footnote says, confessing. And then when you look at this same verse in the American Standard Version, it says, the fruit of lips which makes confession to his name. That's in the American Standard. See, we confess him when we worship him, when we sing, when we pray, anything that is coming out of our lips needs to be, in effect, a confessing of him. We confess him when we take a stand for him and for his word. In Luke 9 and verse 26, it says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words of him, shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. 
But confession can lead to trouble. We read that just a moment ago when Jesus made the confession of him being the son of God. Then they took that and said, see, he's blaspheming. What, what else do we do? So his, the confession of who Jesus is got Jesus himself into trouble. But we confess him, then we need to understand that it also may lead to trouble. Turn over with me to John 9. And beginning with verse 18, here is the occasion where Jesus heals a man that has been blind from birth. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, said, his parents, I'm sorry, answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was blind, but by what means he now sees, we know not. Or who has opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Then look at verse 22. These words spake his parents because... They feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. They knew what their confession would do. And not only that, we have another occasion of it in the 12th chapter of the book of John, in verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. And then look at the rest of the verse. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Confessing Christ can get you into trouble. It may cause you trouble on the job. It may cause you trouble at school. It may cause you trouble with your friends. It may even cause trouble with your family. Nevertheless, we must hold to our confession at all costs. In Hebrews 4, verse 14, seeing then that you have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And then in chapter 10 of Hebrews, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And two, we honor Christ by partaking as we just have of his memorial supper. Jesus ordained that we remember him that we remember his death. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you. But George reminded us of these verses, and also the one in 1 Corinthians 11. For there it was said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. And we know that the early disciples met upon the first day of the week to observe the Lord's Supper, Acts 20 and verse 7. Is it, and it is of utmost importance 
that we properly discern the Lord's body when we partake of the unleavened bread, when we partake of the fruit of the vine. You know, we're told later in 1 Corinthians 11 at verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. See, for Christians to fail, to meet with other Christians, and to partake of the Lord's Supper, that is to dishonor Christ. Remember James said in James 4, verse 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And we honor Christ with our substance. In Proverbs 3 and verse 9, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thine increase. To honor the Lord with our substance is to give him of our living. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. In 2 Corinthians 9, Verse 7, every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And then it's in Proverbs, in chapter 21, verse 25, the desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refused to labor. He covered it greedily all the day long but the righteous giveth and spareth not. Friends, God has richly given us all things to enjoy. That's exactly what James said in James 1 in verse 17, when he said, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the body of life with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And remember Paul told Timothy in instructing those that are rich in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And we need to understand that we are stewards of the blessings that God has given us. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. What is a steward? A steward is you and me. We are stewards in the sense that everything that we have has been given to us. They belong to God, but he's given them to us. That's why and how we are stewards. We have within our possession something that doesn't belong to us. Oh, we may have worked, we may have put in the hours, you know, all this, that, and the other. But who gave us life? Who gave us strength? Who gave us the mental faculties to do the jobs that we do, to do anything that we do? See, everything that we have is because God has given it to us. We are stewards. And if that's not enough, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 26, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There's nothing in this world. Remember when God created in Genesis 1? Each and every day of those six days that he created, do you remember how those days ended? God saw that it was good. 
and everything that God created, it was good. And therefore, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And our reward, let us understand, is dependent. Our reward in eternity is dependent on our faithful stewardship while we're here on this earth. In Luke 16 and verse 9, Jesus said, I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? I think that last sentence could very well apply to each and every human being. If we've not been faithful in that which is another man's, and we just got through finishing saying that the world is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, everything we have, every good and perfect gift that we have, temporally and spiritually, it's ours because God has given it to us. So if we cannot be faithful, and that which God has given unto us, then the question, how shall he really and truly give unto us that which is our own eternal life? How can he give it to us if we're not faithful? Let's review. We honor Christ by imitating him. We honor Christ by confessing him before men. We honor Christ by partaking of his memorial supper. We honor Christ with our substance. You know, if you are not a Christian, will you not honor Christ by confessing his name before this audience and being baptized into Christ? Do the same as the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, he obeyed the gospel, and he went on his way rejoicing. We read about that in Acts 8, when it said in verse 36, as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said unto Peter, Philip, See, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the unit, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the unit saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. See, the unit honored Christ by confessing Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When you obey, the forgiveness of sins will be sure as well as your hope of eternal life. That will rest upon the foundation, the solid foundation, a foundation that cannot be shaken. But as a Christian, if you're not faithful in that which the Lord requires of you, then you're not honoring him. So repent and pray as a one that has obeyed the gospel that we might be forgiven of our sins. And if we can assist you to either of these ends, let it be known by coming to the front while together we stand to sing.